last speaker, who is Alexandra Meyer. All right. Hello. Thank you so much. So my name is Alexandra Meyer, and I am going to be speaking about the neurobiology of mindfulness. You're getting another mirror neuron presentation. Congratulations. And it is an exploration of mirror neurons during acts of worship specifically. So to give you an outline and kind of know what to expect through this presentation, Dr. Schreier did a fantastic job of introducing mirror neurons, so I do not need to go too far in depth with that. And we are going to be exploring modern functions and questions surrounding mirror neurons, as well as relating this to social cognition, our ability to relate socially and theory of mind. And then finally, applying this all to corporate worship. What does this mean coming together as a body of Christ and engaging in corporate worship? So the famous macaque monkey study published in 1992 discovered that neurons of the rostral part of our inferior premotor cortex of this monkey would discharge during goal-directed hand movements. So this was either picking up an apple, putting it to the mouth, or picking up an apple and throwing it into a bowl. And they recognized that this F5 region of our inferior premotor cortex would discharge whether the monkey was actually performing the task or visualizing the task being done. So doing or visualization. And because humans also had this F5 region of the inferior premotor cortex, it was thought, well, perhaps we can find this similar response present in human beings. And over time, um, over hundreds of studies, it was actually found, yes, human, humans did possess these mirror neurons. And they conducted it using PETs, fMRIs, TMS, MEG, EEGs, really electrical and magnetic resonance imaging of the brain. And what they saw was input from your superior temporal sulcus would send information to your rostral IPL or inferior parietal lobe, and then shoot it forward to your ventral premotor cortex, which included that Broca's area F5. And this would be visual stimulation, so something that you're seeing, or studies have recently shown that audio stimulation or something that you're hearing will also trigger the same response. And as studies have continued to be conducted, we have found mirror neurons present in the human brain in several different areas. So our premotor cortex, which integrates our sensory information and our motor information. So we see something or we hear something and we decide how we are going to respond respond to it, as well as our supplementary motor area, which involves our planning and integrating information in different ways, as well as our somatosensory, primary somatosensory cortex, which includes proprioception and receives and processes all of our sensory information from our entire body, as well as our parietal, our inferior parietal cortex, which is our sensory motor transformations for object grasping and manipulation. This can actually be altered by observational stress. So if somebody were to take an fMRI of me right now, I guarantee you that would be up because a little bit of observational stress is happening right now. Uh, but these are the areas where we can see mirror neurons present in the human brain. And as we are continuing to learn and discover, the question really is, why, why is this important? Why do mirror neurons matter, specifically when we are looking at social cognition and development? Well, the impact of these discoveries is how, how do we understand each other better? Well, mirror neurons can help us answer that question, how we are able to relate to each other. How are we able to understand other humans, both in the actions that we are doing, as well as the intentions behind those actions and why we do what we do, right? And why we relate to other people and their actions and their intentions. And within that, it is important because mirror neurons are kind of a form of quasi-motor neurons as well, but there are a couple of key differences. And one of the key differences is there's no requirement of cognitive stimulation within our mirror neurons. So motor neurons, you are performing an action as a result of this stimulus. In mirror neurons, it's observational and you will still have that same response in the participant as in the individual who is observing the response. And within that, as they are studying the development of these mirror neurons, they realize that it actually develops in an individual before 12 months of age, really early. And it comes as early as being able to stabilize LTPs or low threshold power movements and tiny micro eye tracking, things like that have been able to be contributed towards developing something called synaptic plasticity or the Hebbian theory. 
And Donald Hebb in 1949 came up with this idea of synaptic plasticity or neurons that fire together are going to wire together. Essentially what this means is when we have a few neurons that are firing with the same rate, with the same intensity at the same time, we are going to strengthen those pathways. We are going to see an increase in the number of synapses in those areas. Whereas if we have a second input that is not firing, it's a little bit incongruent. So it's firing differently and has unrelated output patterns, we're gonna see that start to prune back. We are going to lose those synaptic connections. And that relates to something called associative learning, where we have simultaneous activities. So these neurons firing at the same rate with the same intensity at the same time, we're gonna see a strengthening of those pathways. We are going to depth in that relationship. Whereas if we don't have it, or it's a little bit incongruent, then we're gonna see this starting to get pruned back. This is where this saying comes in, use it or lose it. You can see it in soccer. If you're not practicing regularly, you can see it in studying. If you don't study, you're gonna lose that material. This is the same on a neurobiological level. You can use the information or you're gonna lose the information. And that started to cause this idea of, well, where do we develop it one? So where are we developing our ability to increase our relationship, our social understanding of each other through these neuro mirror neurons and how do we practice, right? How do we continue to develop and grow these skills? And one of the theories that came as a result of that was an idiomotor theory. The idiomotor theory is that actions are represented by effect or your typical cause and effect. This is an excellent, excellent way to understand the development of learning intention. Because you can see with little babies, if you were to make faces at little babies, they're gonna copy what you do, right? You stick out your tongue, the little kid's gonna stick out its tongue. And this is great for starting to develop this idea of intentions, but this misses something pretty key because in this, now we have the question, what mechanisms are going to be in place to distinguish between self-representation and other representation? So now how are we able to distinguish between imitating the motor actions of others when they're established as the other versus self? So we need mechanisms for both, mechanisms for relating to others in regards to ourselves and that ability to distinguish between the two. And in some modern research, Brass et al. did a really wonderful job of starting to analyze this distinguishment between our internal generation and observation of others. And that was through a process called mentalizing and utilizing mental state attribution, or our ability to attribute causal roles of, of the actions of self versus others, and utilizing introspection and priming in order to do that. And one of the things with mirror neurons is they use the functional overlap hypothesis or that we have several different areas in our brain where we are seeing mirror neurons show up and they're present. And we're realizing that when these fire in certain patterns at certain times, then they mean different things. So specifically in this case, they looked at the anterior frontal medial cortex, as well as the temporal parietal junction, and looked at congruent versus incongruent actions. And essentially what they learned is that common computational processes would subserve both the intentional control of shared representations, as well as later developing social cognitive capabilities. So we are seeing both of these areas of our brain, specifically where mirror neurons are present, help with that distinguishment between self versus other. And now we are moving into really more of these postulated functions of mirror neurons and some of the things that we talked about a little bit earlier today as well. So some of our postulated functions of our mirror neurons is one, understanding intention, intentions of ourselves as well as intention of others. The second thing is what happens when our mirror neurons aren't functioning really the way that they are designed. And that has been postulized to hear, uh, to lead towards social disorders. And then as well, looking at the development of emotions and empathy. How do we empathize with each other? How do we form relationships with each other, as well as developing social cognition and social competence? And currently there are actually two really big theories or philosophical hypotheses for how we develop this social competence. The first is that we are able to infer others' internal mental states and ascribe them to a causal role. So we're analyzing and looking at somebody else's experience. We are guessing how they are feeling about it, partially due to our ability to relate to them on a neurological level with our mirror neurons. And then we're ascribing a causal role to that. 
The second is that we are comparing an action done by others with our own internal framework. So we're taking what we have learned through our experiences and our observations, and then we are providing that kind of background, and we are using their response to compare with our own framework. And I would like to argue there actually should be a third philosophical hypothesis that is a union between these two, where not only do we use our framework, but we also use our observational ability, our ability to connect on an empathetic level using these mirror neurons to be able to infer internal uh, mental states while ascribing and comparing them to a framework of our own responses with the knowledge that, yes, this is somebody else with a unique and diverse thought process and mind frame. And that really comes with this ability to develop theory of mind and develop um, different attributes in those regards. So mindfulness and theory of mind. The theory of mind is really that analysis of thoughts and intentions. And there's a nice little pyramid structure when we're looking at developing these different aspects. One is our executive functioning, which is really that practical mindset, looking at chronological time management and planning, organization skills. Uh, you learn a lot of that in primary and secondary school. And that second side is social competence. How are we able to relate to each other in a social setting well? And all of these relate to our theory of mind and our ability to understand ourselves better so that we can understand others. And then there's a couple of mechanisms of action that are utilized pretty regularly in order to develop this theory of mind. So we have meditation, which is that willful and purposeful regulation of one's own attention. And this has been studied in relationship to mirror neurons actually moderately extensively and how we are able to use these mirror neurons to focus and center and introspect on ourselves. And the second is mindfulness, which is a growing clinical practice where we are doing the same type of thing, where we're able to use this introspection to reduce stress, to increase understanding of ourselves, to increase social competence, as well as executive functioning. So all of these things relate really, really, really closely to each other. And now applying this a little bit more to scripture and what we're going to be talking about today with our corporate worship. So Matthew 18, 20 says, when two or three are gathered in my name, there I am with them. And this is really talking about that corporate experience, that we are a diverse body of Christ, all with different opinions, thoughts, mindsets, experiences going on. And even with our own identity, we are able to relate to each other on a neurological level with our mirror neurons. And the second is Galatians 6, 2, where we are called to carry each other's burdens. And in this way, we fulfill the law of Christ. In this, we are called and required to relate to each other on a corporate level in order to cover each other's strengths or cover each other's weaknesses with our strengths and relate as a community. So applying this really specifically to corporate worship, the classical definition of corporate worship is a gathering of the church. It is where we are engaging in group practices in a corporate setting. And I have seen this many, many, many different ways. You have your standard uh, worship leader on the stage and everybody's singing and relating to each other in that way, worshiping God in that way. I've seen art as a form of corporate worship. I've, I've seen dancing as a form of corporate worship. And really it all boils down to an expression of devotion and a way that you encounter God on a corporate level. And this differs between denominations and individuals. There's no one right, wrong, right or wrong way to do it. It really is encountering God and creating those deep empathetic connections. We're able to relate to each other as a community better and in turn relate to God in that way as well. And this transcends isolated experiences, not only on a physical level or on an emotional level or a spiritual level, but it also transcends on a physical level within our mirror neurons. Because in intimate worship, not only are we getting visual stimulation of our mirror neuron system by observing the people next to us, our community, our corporation around us worshiping, but also sound stimulation of the mirror neuron system as well. So you have two different stimuli that are contributing to creating this corporate experience where you are able to engage with each other better and in turn engage with the Lord as well. And with that, there's some key aspects that we've talked about with our mirror neuron system, that our thoughts are going to predict our behaviors, that we're able to determine the difference between our actions, our thoughts, um, and how our thoughts will eventually predict our actions. But with a word of caution on that is to avoid thinking. 
Yes, perfect. Uh, avoid thinking about this on an intellectual only mindset, right? Because we are not just brains on sticks. We are not walking around just designed to take in all intellectual information and that's it. We are beings that have multi, multiple, multiple dimensions between our spirituality, our emotions, our uh, and our intellectual capabilities and the blessing of being able to be here and relate to each other in this way as well. And James Smith had a wonderful theory on this called the embodied actors, where we take all of these aspects and we connect them together. And these, this thought predicting behavior, our neuroscience actually allows us not only to engage in self formation and introspection and development of our own abilities and our own personal relationship with God, but also expand that to our relationship with others where we're able to be together as that unified body of Christ with our diverse abilities, thoughts, opinions, all of those different things. And on a bodily level, connect to each other in a unique way. So just as a reminder, each of these different aspects are so important and they're vital for Christian life, but they're not the totality. It is everything coming together and forming that relationship as a community for Christ that is so important and is shown on a level as deep as our neurology. And with that, I just want to leave you again with this verse is that we're called to carry each other's burdens. And in that way, we are fulfilling the law of Christ. And here are my references. And do you have any questions for me? Thanks for a really interesting talk. But I want to go read more about motor neurons. I'm an immunologist, so I don't know a lot about this. Uh, do I have any questions here? Yes, Dr. Schreier. Um, hi, Alexa. It's good to see you again. Um, with the Zoom, and we're doing a lot of online church, how do you think this affects all of that? You know, I was actually, funny enough, I was thinking about this yesterday, and I looked it up, and mirror neurons, so recent studies, thanks to the coronavirus pandemic, have shown that mirror neurons are stimulated virtually as well through visualization and connection through that way. And I think intentionality in that is important. Um, and the mind space that you're entering into as a community is important within that. But mirror neurons are activated during a community on technology, which is fascinating. Tony? Uh, quick question as a biologist. Um, oxytocin is a hormone that uh, stimulates bonding in a variety of contexts. Do you know if these mirror neurons respond to oxytocin that might stimulate their action? Because you talked oh, about empathy. Like I that. do know that they are stimulated in what is known as highly spiritual environments. So they did a study on a Pentecostal church. Um, and when they were praying in tongues, it was actually really stimulating that mirror neuron system. And I'm curious, I don't know specifically about oxytocin, but I would imagine just based on the background research and the environments where we're seeing that stimulation, that that would be the case. But I'd have to look farther into detail about that. Um, Baylor's Truett Seminary. Hello, thank you so much for a great presentation, Alexandra. Actually, Shelby Livingston is in the room and she says you're awesome. But I do have a question for you. Uh, with this, uh, with uh, the insights that you brought, uh, how does that should inform our uh, view of corporate worship, especially in the light of recent developments in worship that has been seen as an individualized quest between the person and God? Ooh, interesting. Um, you know, kind of like I said, there is a really vital aspect of community in engaging in worship. Um, although it is not the end all be all where you need to have, you cannot have any relationship with God on an individual basis. I don't think that's true at all. Um, but I do think in recent events, finding ways to engage in corporate worship is really important. Um, and even in the ability to stretch and push each other in different ways as well and to continue development, that type of community is, is necessary um, and really vital for Christian life as a whole. So I think being able to find alternatives and engaging in worship practices in a safe environment is important. Like I said, uh, recent studies have shown that you're seeing this relationship, you're seeing this activation of mirror neurons on zoom and finding ways and alternatives and continuing to grow and develop this understanding of our neuroscience can also help us to better understand what we're looking at as a whole in corporate worship and ways that we can engage with each other and engage with God differently in that way as well. 
if that answers your question. So we're running slightly over, but Janet, you can ask a question and we will finish there. So you partly answered my question already. I was actually going to ask if you've done research on, um, well, there has been a fair bit of research on charismatic phenomena. And mm -hmm. um, I, in terms of evaluating the, it, whether it's a genuine movement of the Holy Spirit uh, mm -hmm. or not, and I would suspect that for, for some, some of it could be explained through mirror neurons in terms of you know, groups being um, slain in the spirit, et cetera. Just mm -hmm. wondering any thoughts on that. Oh, gosh. Um, I, in reading those studies on the Pentecostal worship and actually seeing the results of the fMRIs, there is, there is something that you are seeing really, really, really extreme activation of those mirror neurons in all aspects in that forward. So we have our forward thinking the way that we relate to each other. And I'm talking to you, you are hearing, receiving the information we're seeing mirror neurons activation in that, but even in sitting individually and praying, you're having that same activation. So it's interesting. Um, but as far as the theology goes, I am certainly not the expert uh, in that. So Thanks. Well, I want to thank uh, all three speakers. You've uh, really presented some fascinating um, things that I want to think about and look at some of the references. And um, that's really, really exciting uh, work that all of you are presenting. So thank you very much. Thank you.